We need uh, people to get up to speed with climate change and ocean change very, very, very quickly so that they can understand that things have to happen now because we need this mass mobilization of the general public to overcome the obstruction which is being imposed by our very own governments that are supposed to protect us. being here today to hear the second part of our issues topics. That is, we're going to focus today not so much on the problem, but also the solutions. Because we believe that the effects of climate change, while disastrous, while challenging, and while difficult, must have solutions that we can enact in order for us to maintain a degree of hope and survival on this planet. So I'm very glad to be here today with my other uh, panelists, Paul Beckwith and Peter Carter. And so I'll go ahead and start us off. I have a few slides that I'd like to share regarding the issue of water. So again, we have the issue of 2% approximately of the world's water, which is potable. And that is our allotment, just 2% for an ever increasing population around the world. And I wanna talk about a few particular places. I just wanna briefly touch on some of the problems um, before I get to the solutions. So um, we're looking at this amazing city, Jakarta. It's a beautiful city. It's a home of over 35 million people and it's, it's rapidly sinking. It's rapidly sinking. Um, while it looks like a beautiful modern city, and it is, a major portion of people in Jakarta live in what we may term urban slums, much like this one you see here. And there's very little to no water infrastructure to support this massive and ever-growing population. So how do these, <coughs> excuse me, how do these people who depend on water to survive, how do they get that water that they need? Well, um, necessity is the mother of invention. And so what a lot of people in Jakarta do is they drill wells into the aquifers and then they pump out that groundwater. Normally this would be fine because groundwater is constantly being refilled by rainfall. However, that's not happening in Jakarta. Because of the urbanization, the sidewalks, the roads, are all made of concrete, of course, and that prevents water from getting into the aquifers. And as a result of this, the rainwater has nowhere to go. And instead, instead of being absorbed through the soils, through the ground and filling up those aquifers and keeping the land where it should be, it's just rushes out into the sea. This is really problematic because not only does it leave no water for the individuals to drink or use, but it's also pushing pollutants, chemicals into the sea. But a big problem is Jakarta is sinking. It's sinking 12 centimeters a year. It's highly significant. And this is because for want of drinking water. And I want to emphasize that Jakarta is not alone. There are many, many world cities that are having problems acquiring drinking water. These are mega cities and they include Mexico City. London, Sao Paulo, and even Miami. So what are we to do? The lack of drinking water with water runoff and incredible storm water runoff and aquifers being depleted day by day. There is a solution. There is a solution. And the wonderful thing about the solution is it's affordable. It's easy to do. And the solution is called bioswale. And as you can see by this picture here, it's really quite lovely. Uh, it can be beautiful. It's, it's, it's not, it can be easily placed into the landscape of any city. And you can see that um, there's gravel, there's mulch, 
And these things serve to filter the pollutants out of the water. And it also can be a lovely part of the landscape because you can have plants, you can have trees. And you may wonder, well, you know, you know what about, here we have a parking lot, a parking lot that would otherwise be unsightly. And instead of just having a curb here with cement over there, you have beautiful plants that will filter the pollutants and allow water to go into the groundwater system. And this bioswale can happen anywhere, even in a dry, arid area. Many parts of California get very little rain, but with xeriscaping, that is using native plants, bioswales can be effective. In very wet areas, they can be highly attractive. You can grow tall trees and this will in turn purify the air. It is a multifaceted solution that offers so much more than we even give. And with these bioswales strategically placed within any modern city, we can not only allow uh, beauty, pure air, and uh, uh, increase the aquifers, the groundwater that is so important, but we can provide clean drinking water to an ever-growing populace. So I want to encourage every one of you to have hope and to know that, you know, we can have solutions to a very, very incredibly pressing and difficult problem. And with this, I'd like to move on to the next solution, which will be offered by Paul Beckwith. Okay. Um, thank you, Regina. Um, and uh, I... For quite a while, I've been talking about the idea of a, a, a three-legged stool type approach uh, for solutions. Um, you know, in a way, uh, climate change is is almost like we're it, it's chipping away at our resilience, societal resilience. It's you know, you can call it death by a thousand cuts. You know, one storm upon another storm upon another storm is causing tremendous um, um, hardship to large numbers of people. Of course, the latest example is this week from the cold snap over Texas that has um, now, you know, at the peak, it took out about a third of the power grid in Texas. So there were 4.5 million people in the state, million homes rather, and if you take three, pe three people per average residence, that's about 13 and a half million people who were without power. And a lot of the homes are, they're not insulated in the deep south, of course. And uh, they're, the heating there is, is electrical uh, baseboard heating, things like that. So without that electricity, uh, many homes got m very, very cold and that caused uh, burst pipes and things. So there's all these cascading things that happen. Now, as more and more people um, on the planet have uh, been migrating to cities, um, you know, fighting climate change is important and solutions are important. There's no one solution, of course. There's many, many possible solutions. And I've talked about um, measures like, uh, you know, we have to slash fossil fuel emissions as being one leg of the bar stool carbon dioxide removal, ways to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That could just be as simple as leaving the trees in place and uh, replanting programs to extract more CO2 or trying to stimulate um, phytoplankton growth in the oceans is another possibility. And there's also um, the ideas of solar radiation management. Um, but in terms of the... Um, those are large scale things. Um, more and more people are in cities. So there's an awful lot of things that cities can do um, to uh, address climate change, to reduce the problem. And, you know, when we talk about global average temperatures, nobody lives in a global average temperature. So if you're in a city dweller and you're in a, if you're a city dweller and you're in a large city, the city, the temperatures, um, the warming rates and the temperatures that you're experiencing in these cities is much, much larger than the global average. In fact, it's uh, because of the urban heat island effect, all the concrete and uh, black surfaces absorbing additional sunlight, cities are warming at much, much faster rates than the surrounding 
rural areas, you know, whether it be two, three, four times faster than the surrounding rural areas. Now, continents are also warming at at least double the rate that the oceans are warming at. So you would need to add that additional factor. Um, if your city is at high um, elevation, Denver, Mile High City, for example, then uh, the warming rates are increased um, in high, as you go up in, in, uh, in uh, elevation. Um, so all of these factors mean that the temperatures, you know, I, I've mentioned in the last uh, session that in 2020, the global average temperature was reported to be 1.25 degrees Celsius of the 1880 to 1910 baseline which they called pre-industrial, but the real pre-industrial is the year 1750. And you eat, for the baseline shift, you need to add 0.3. So the global average temperature in 2020 was 1.25 plus 0.3 or 1.55 above the 1750 value. But then if you're in a city, if you're on a continent, you need to double that. If you're in a city, you need to double or quadruple it as well as the doubling on top of the doubling. So, you know, we're experiencing, you know, if you're in a Northern country, if you're at a higher latitude, like the entire country of Canada, the global, the temperature rise in Canada was more than double, um, du between double, two times and three times that of the global temperature average. So then it says if you're in a city in the Northern part, you know, um, of Canada, the warming is even more greatly accelerated. So, so basically the crisis is very severe. We need to, there's no one solution. We need to look at all of the uh, possible ideas from a technology and scientific point. But I wanna make the point that we need, we need a different mindset. We need a different frame of mind on growth and how we operate things and how we vote in our politicians. And because we're seeing you know, as climate disruption and mayhem accelerates, we're seeing equivalent um, levels of mayhem in our political systems in, and um, we don't have a resilient society. We're finding that out from the coronavirus and, and our handling of it. We don't have a resilient society. From systems theory, the more complex a society is, the less resilient it is. So um, there's, so I think the first part is, is uh, of, of solutions is we need to educate people young people, older people, everybody on how serious the climate crisis is and the time frames. Uh, we don't have time. We have to make strong action now. So it is encouraging um, the, with the new US government and you know rejoining the Paris Accord that just happened. Um, and lots of people you know, are being trained to educate people via groups like Climate Reality, which, which is, 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 is and uh, you know, there's there's more and more people around the world that are becoming aware of, of the problems. So um, that those are the key things. We need to change ourselves, and we need to change how we interact with our with our environment. Thanks so much, Paul. It's so true that with so many people moving to urban centers, that um, the 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 seriousness of of what's happening with climate change and how it's affecting so many multiple lives cannot be overrated. And then of course we have the people being driven from um, you know, subsistence farming to the cities because of climate change. So it's uh, feedback upon feedback and it's, it's, it truly is very complex and difficult. I would love to switch over to Dr. Peter Carter to hear some of his solutions. So solutions, yeah, this is the best and actually the most exciting part of what uh, otherwise would be a pretty dismal uh, issue, which is uh, climate destruction, also ocean destruction. Um, the uh, popular magazines for years and years and years have been uh, publishing uh, exciting, highly informative articles saying and explaining we have all the solutions to climate change, right? And over the past few years, we've had more and more solutions, um, uh, more effective solutions, even more exciting. And uh, the great thing about them is, of course, the solutions um, for providing electricity become cheaper. And that is really um, uh, a key for people to understand about renewable or non-combustion everlasting energy 
And that is the more we develop it, the cheaper it gets for us to pay for it. And the more we use it, also the cheaper it gets. That's completely the opposite to what happens with fossil fuel energy. So uh, the economic incent incentive is very, very high. I, I want to emphasize and agree with Paul, um, uh, who um, did something that uh, a lot of people forget about, and, and that's pointed to the importance of education. Education is still number one, right? Um, I recall back in 2006, the UK government Stern Commission report, which was very, very good, I thought. And um, uh, the Stern Commission had a recipe of, of solutions. And one of them I found very interesting, which was a public information campaign um, by the government of climate change information and persuasion, right? So um, that's really what governments should be doing. They're, they're, they're not doing it. Um, uh, it would be really nice if the advertising industry um, did something like that, but we need uh, people to get up to speed with climate change and ocean change very, very, very quickly so that they can understand that things have to happen now because we need this mass mobilization of the general public to overcome the obstruction which is being imposed by our very own governments that are supposed to protect us. Um, Bill Gates, uh, has um, got quite a bit of, actually a lot, of media um, day after day um, because he did a um, program on 60 Minutes on solutions for climate change. And he's got a new book out apparently as well. Bill Gates started by uh, saying the thing that is absolutely most important. I'm very disappointed that the climate change experts um, seem to be taking some backward steps on, on this. Um, zero carbon is the law of climate change physics. And it was really good to hear Bill Gates emphasize that. Now, uh, zero or virtual zero applies to uh, all the long lasting greenhouse gases. So the science here is crucial. It sounds like it's gonna be difficult, but actually it make it easier. So the IPCC in 2015, their last assessment said that the emissions of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and the F gases or halocarbons, which are all classified as very long lasting greenhouse gases, have to be reduced to quote, near zero, unquote. That means that all of this talk, which everybody or most people seem to have um, uh, been following, um, uh, I guess it came from the policymakers and the governments. All this talk about carbon neutral and net zero um, is uh, misleading nonsense. Uh, you can say um, net zero as long as you condition that because you have to get back to virtual zero CO2. As long as you condition that with uh, zero fossil fuel combustion, but you also have to condition it to zero carbon combustion. Uh, because now we, uh, we have a horrible thing going on, uh, particularly in Europe, that they're changing their big coal power plants to burning wood pellets, which is just as bad, if not worse. So uh, the solution, the solution is uh, zero combustion as regards carbon dioxide and also some methane and nitrous oxide, which comes from the burning of fossil fuels. How do we do that? Well, there the key is one word. It's conversion, right? And we have known also for many, many years that we can totally convert the goods and services that are greenhouse gas polluting, as well as polluting in other ways. We can totally convert those to non-polluting goods and services. It's very, very obvious, and I think more and more and more people understand that that applies to fossil fuel energy. We can completely convert, and we have to totally, complete, completely convert fossil fuel energy to clean non-combustion zero carbon energy. We have to do it with the, uh, with the other things as well. Um, the F gases, which are very, very, very potent and long lasting greenhouse gases, it's very easy to con convert those. It's absolutely ridiculous. They're still being manufactured. They're man-made, human-made chemicals. So we've got to convert those to alternatives. We did with PCBs, for example. 
this is nothing new, we've had to do it before. And uh, then we come to something which is um, gratifyingly getting more and more attention, which is our food production. So there, there's sort of two big, um, easy to remember reasons. Um, for climate change and ocean disruption and emissions of greenhouse gases. The one, of course, that everybody knows is industrial energy production, but industrial food production is really big as well. So that has to be converted, right? We have to convert our highly, highly successful, but very damaging to the soils, degrading to the soils, and uh, also uh, very damaging to wildlife, insects, and birds. We have to convert the, um, uh, the mechanized, chemical-intensive, monoculture, agriculture industry. And, and there's lots and lots and lots of research to show the benefits of doing that and the fact that we can do it. So I'll finish up with Bill Gates, who gave a great example of conversion, in which he says, you know, um, uh, we, sh we here should not be eating uh, meat, which is killed animals. Well, he didn't say that, but mm -hmm. that's what he meant. He said, what we should be doing is we should not be eating that meat at all. And we should be eating uh, plant-based or synthetic meat. Now, I'm a vegan. And many years ago, it was not, not a bit, bit hard to be a vegan. You know, you go out to a restaurant and you get a bit of celery stick and a carrot. Um, but the, uh, the industry, the co corporations are now produce these fabulous, I mean, you, I can eat anything. I can eat, you know, vegan shrimp, vegan lobster, you know, vegan steak, you name it, it's out there. So uh, that's a really good example of how the private sector has responded to, um, uh, you know, being good to society as well as making money, making good money. So uh, please, everybody, remember conversion. Less is not enough. Uh, more efficient is not enough, right? It has to be a conversion of our polluting pro goods and processes to non-polluting. And I'll finish with that. Thank you so much. Um, there's a lot there and uh, a lot to focus on in terms of solutions. Um, my question, I guess, goes to both of you. Well, it seems from these presentations that there's definitely a way, but um, what I wanna know is in terms of the will, I know, uh, Peter, you spoke about the importance of education and Paul, you spoke about, uh, you gave a great example of Texas uh, you know, a lot of the problems that happen in Texas are not necessarily related to climate change, but the, um, the, the governmental errors that were made, shall we generously call them. And uh, in terms of education, we've had decades of miseducation regarding climate change. Uh, so how, how do we go from knowing that there is a way to enacting the will? That, that's a question I'll, I'll leave for both of you. Okay, um, I think this really gets at the um, at human nature. Um, we, we have to acknowledge the, some of the facts of um, you know, our species. And, and one of the facts is that a small percentage of us do not have empathy a small percentage of, and if we don't have empathy, you know, or any care or feeling to the well-being of other people, if we're just in it for ourselves, then there's a term for that, and it's called it's it's psychopathic. There's a, a small percentage of the, of humans are are psychopaths basically, and the problem is is one of the traits of those people is that they're forever driven to advance and to get ahead. And they don't care about uh, whose toes they step on, and they don't care about it's only themselves, right? And so they 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 they're completely driven, and they get to positions of power, of political power, and then they're enabled by, for example, the fossil fuel industry if they're fossil fuel friendly. Yes, build as many coal mines, build the pipelines, uh, you know, pull everything out of the of the earth before you know, while, while we still can. And in fact, as climate change worsens, 
they feel an almost an urgency to act quicker at pulling fossil fuels out because they realize that it's not going to be occurring in, in the long run. So one of the huge problems is, uh, you know, that's resulting is we're getting lots of wealth um, with just a few people. And the, the virus is a perfect example of, of making that even worse because some of the largest uh, companies we're making money hand over fist while everybody else is suffering. And we see this by having record stock market levels as we're getting record suffering and job loss and so on from, from people, you know, and misery, human misery. Look at the look at what's been happening with all those people in the cold and dark and they can't eat, they're told to boil water, right? And how do you boil water if you don't have the natural gas or the electricity to boil the water? I mean, they may as well have been told to just bring snow into your house if your house is above freezing and, and drink the water that melts from the snow. I mean, some boiling water, you know, they can't do it. So, so um, the problem is, is the political system. It's how we are leaders. It's how they gain power. Um, it's the first past the post situation with, you know, people are voting for parties. And I, I think party voting for parties is a bit of archaic because you're not going to agree to everything that one party does or says, you know, and if you give them the power, they, once they're in, they do what they want and, and they eliminate all of the policies from the previous party. So everything is sort of, you know, you set up a renewable energy program and then four years later, it's killed by the next government and then you bring it in again. I mean, we're going in an endless loop and we can't make any progress. So we need to, you know, perhaps we need to really look at, at voting more on issues, having collaborative governments and setting policies in place to address climate change, for example, that are fixed. And it doesn't matter what party comes in, right? You have those policies in place and uh, you know you don't you can't change them basically. It's not a cyclical thing and to address long-term problems. So I don't know, it's a whole sort of human nature, how we govern ourselves and, and how we think about you know, we, we think that we're separate from the environment. Of course, nothing is further from the truth. We're all connected intricately to the environment. So, um, yeah, so again, this comes to education. And also, um, we have to figure out how to, the pendulum swung too far to, to free speech, I think. By, by that, what I mean is that people are free and do not suffer any consequences from telling outright lies right they can there's there's no consequences and they can completely you know they can they can disillusion or give improper information to millions and millions of people who you know so we get sort of these like cult like followings that are completely devoid of, of reality but it has huge influence on large parts of the population and it precludes us actually doing the right thing on like we build a wall in texas what about uh reinforcing the power lines in texas Right. I mean, I mean, we, we, we do that. We do the most silly things and, and we ignore the key infrastructure that we need to keep keep uh, cities going. Right. So, I mean, the, the, the Texas thing is a perfect example of what not to do to govern. So. Thank you. I would agree. Um, Peter, any closing words? Um, regarding. So, yeah, I, I again, I definitely agree with. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I definitely agree with Paul pointing out um, uh, that um, we we have a worldview problem, you know. Um, and I agree with Paul. We we don't have a human nature problem. Um, human beings are um, not hardwired to destroy themselves and destroy the planet. Um, my, my three C's uh, as a solution are compassion, and Paul mentioned empathy. And uh, we are clearly a compassionate species, you know. Uh, we help somebody whose life is at risk um, as an instant second response. If somebody's out drowning, you know, it's well known, right? Um, if there are disasters, people rush in, you know, at the risk of their own lives to help other people. So we're a compassionate species and, and we, should, um, we should be proud of that. We should remember that. Um, my second C is cooperation. 
And the human species has been successful over its 200,000 year. We're 200,000 years old, you know, we're not just 200 years old. And we've been, uh, we've been highly successful. And as very small numbers of people, tiny tribes in very, for them with no big technology, harsh environments and saber toothed tigers and heaven knows what. Well. And uh, they succeeded because they were highly cooperative, of course. And uh, their cooperation le uh, led to the development of language and that led to, and here we are, right? So we are in essence, um, compassionate and cooperative. And we need to put that up more and more and more. So it was very good to hear Paul, Paul refer to that because Paul's definitely a scientist, um, uh, but uh, we have a problem of separating science, right? From uh, what is called humanities, but it's separating science from what is of value, what is important and what we need to be doing. And one of the problems with climate change science is it doesn't go there. It, it just goes with the cold facts. And that is not enough. It's not enough on any scientific issue, you know? Science must be directed to what it was originally developed for, which was the acquisition of knowledge for the benefit of humanity. And we're not really getting that from our climate change experts. So we're trying to fill the gap, I suppose, and other people around the world. We need to, um, and we are trying our best to do that, we, we need to present a compelling vision of the future, right? And there are people, um, uh, some of my friends are doing that, um, we, of course, it's, it's our obligation, it's our duty to, to prevent how bad things are, how terrible things are. But if we make these conversions, the, the future is the best possible future that humanity has ever, ever imagined, right? We can't imagine how good it would be. Just think, endless, unlimited, safe non-polluting, renewable, that is everlasting energy, right? Maybe then we could go to the stars. We should not be going to Mars today. We have a home planet in trouble. So, um, uh, you know, oh my God, you know, so that, 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 that definitely has to be changed. Our uh, young people are being robbed of a, uh, of a great and uh, fantastic future. And that is awful, absolutely awful, um, because the, the possible future, if we did the right things and the clear things by the science that we're explaining, that future is, is, is better than anything. So it's just, um, it's just mind boggling. It, it, it's truly insane that we are not doing this and that we are doing the opposite. And of course, you know, Paul pointed out, we have this problem with our leaders, right? People usually follow leaders. That's also what we are. But we have leaders who are, who are pushing us over the cliff. We have leaders that are pushing us, absolutely pushing us to oblivion. They're still subsidizing fossil fuels actually more in the past few years than they've ever been subsidized before. You know, this is a horrendous crime. This, this, this is a great evil, you know, because they know that the only future of continuing to do that is no future at all, preceded by a miserable, miserable existence. So, um, yeah, we got to get that compelling vision of the future, which is totally based on science and reality, out there as best we can. Thank you so much. Uh, so it's it's been an interesting conversation. We've gone from the positive to a completely dystopian possibility if we don't follow uh, the way to positivity. So the answer is quite clear. We need to be solutions focused. So thank you all so much for uh, listening. And thank you, Peter and, and Paul. Um, Charles and Heidi. It's been an interesting discussion. Thank you.